thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Uh, again, I'm Barry Court, CEO of Heron Therapeutics. Uh, we have uh, a unique platform uh, where we can deliver drugs over an extended period of time. Uh, we have uh, one product already on the market. Uh, we'll, we'll sell about 25 to $30 million worth of that product in its first full year this year. Uh, we anticipate getting a second drug approval in the next three to four weeks. Uh, that product will launch uh, late this year, early next year. And then probably most importantly, uh, we have what we think is our, our crown jewel along the barrel theme, uh, which is a product to control post-operative pain. Uh, it's a product that's instilled into an incision right at the end of surgery, which all but eliminates the need for opiates uh, after surgery to control pain. Uh, our goal is to uh, get the patient through the first three to four days, which is uh, the period of time where they would normally take opioids uh, to get them through that period with as little pain as possible so that they never have to take an opioid. Uh, and what, what's amazing is that one in 10 people who take opioids acutely after surgery go on to be chronic users. Uh, so the ability to stop that cycle we feel is, uh, is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Eric. Uh, my name is Bubba. It's really not. It's Robert is my real name, but I flew airplanes for the Navy, and that was my call sign, and it stuck. Uh, I'm a CFO. Uh, it's my third uh, public company CFO gig, second IPO. Corium uh, is going to celebrate its 18th anniversary here in a couple of months. Only three and a half of that, uh, those years were as a public company. We IPO'd in April of 2014. Our market cap's currently about 400 million. Um, we've done a number of follow-on offerings to support our pipeline. Uh, we've had revenues for many, many years. Uh, we're over 30 million for the last seven. Uh, our most famous product, though, is not a drug. Uh, it's Crest White Strips. We invented it. Uh, we are the sole manufacturer and supplier for Procter & Gamble. But it uses a technology we call Corplex, which does the unbelievable thing of keeping hydrogen peroxide against your wet teeth and sticking for 30 minutes, which as transdermal challenges go, that's a tough one. We took that same technology and we've been putting drugs that are proven safe and effective in that same adhesive, but now we're putting it on the skin as a patch, a way to deliver drugs. Our lead product, which we'll talk about a little bit further, is in Alzheimer's. It takes the most widely prescribed drug, which is uh, the active ingredient in uh, Pfizer E-Size Aricep, puts it in a patch that you wear for one week, uh, which again, the advantage of the Corplex technology proven in white strips is you can wear it for a week. Yeah, okay, great. Um, and before we get into some of the specifics about each of your um, respective products, um, maybe, uh, Baba, could you give some examples of um, some commercially successful transdermal products, and, and Barry, um, maybe you could give some examples of some successful depot products, and within that context, um, maybe, Barry, you could also talk a little bit about how HTX011 is differentiated from generic bupivacaine and even uh, Exparol, and, you know, um, you know, Bubba, you can talk a little bit about how um, you, you, a transdermal product would be uniquely, would uniquely um, um, fit needs within uh, the Alzheimer's space as well. So um, why don't you uh, begin? Sure. Uh, transdermal drug delivery has been around for millennia. Uh, the Chinese 2000 BC started using uh, plasters, they called them, where they put herbs and other things uh, on the skin, basically topicals. But the idea of a drug in an actual patch with an adhesive integrated into the adhesive, uh, started with a company called Alza, uh, which actually uh, my chief executive officer, Peter Staple, and I, we met at Alza. We worked there on the executive team for about seven years together until uh, Alza was sold to Johnson & Johnson for $13 billion. Alza had innovated transdermal drug delivery. The round patch you may have seen people wear behind their ear is scopolamine, 1979. Since then, there have been 23 approved products all but one of which were drugs that were already on the market that uh, mostly Alza put into patch technology and changed the way the drug was delivered. Um, we, we've achieved billion dollar sales with these uh, products. Um, the most successful is fentanyl. If any of you know anybody who's been in a hospice, late stage cancer pain, they've worn this patch. 
uh, for pain. It takes fentanyl, which would have been an anesthetic in the operating room that would put you under and, and dulls your pain without making you tired. That achieved $2 billion in sales. Lidoderm, uh, indicated for shingles, uh, a billion and a half dollar product. Some uh, salon pos, which is essentially aspirin in a patch, which you can buy over the counter, another billion dollar product. But the more recent one uh, that was over a billion is a patch called Exelon, which is an Alzheimer's treatment. It's a once a day patch because that's all that technology can do. Uh, and it delivers the third most popular drug for treating Alzheimer's. All right, great. Uh, and uh, basically along the same approach, the, the idea of whether it's transdermal delivery or a depot where a product is injected into the body and it is slowly released, the, the principle is to deliver the drug over the duration of time that the patient needs that drug, deliver it slowly so you don't get big peaks and then troughs before they take their next dose, to give stable amount of drug and to avoid some of the side effects associated with those big peaks. Um, so from a point of view of a depot product, Lupron probably uh, is the best known multi-billion dollar product where you can deliver it over a month, uh, over three months, four months, or six months, depending on what the patient needs. Um, in our case, um, our first product on the market, Sustol, is for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. It releases uh, one of the best known agents for control of nausea and vomiting over five days, which allows the patient to um, hopefully not experience one of the most common side effects of chemotherapy. Uh, second product that we anticipate approval shortly is also for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Uh, but the, the product uh, Eric mentioned, HTX-011, is a product for post-operative pain that's instilled into the incision, it's a local anesthetic combination. Uh, then the combination allows that local anesthetic to work for the full three days uh, after surgery, a period of time where patients uh, usually take opioids to control pain. Um, and so it's both the release technology and our proprietary invention of, of the two drugs together, both of which are actually old drugs, uh, well known but the, the fact that you could put them together and get 10 to 20 times synergy was never understood until we happened to stumble upon it. And if anyone has been in this type of business, uh, the serendipitous observations are one of the cornerstones of pharmaceutical advances. Uh, and so we're very excited with uh, HDX011 with the ability to have a, really a profound effect on post-operative pain. Barry, you just want to mention a little bit about some of those serendipitous findings and the, the approach in terms of the combination with meloxicam and... Yeah, well, I mean, uh, not to get too much into, into the weeds, but um, bupivacaine, which is the most commonly used local anesthetic, used 11 million times a year for post-operative pain, um, lasts for about six hours. There have been attempts to make it into a long-acting product. Uh, those attempts were or basically extended release depots, uh, but they still only worked for 12 to 24 hours, even though the re drug was being released for longer. And what we found is that it doesn't matter whether you release it for one day, two days, or three days, bupivacaine is gonna stop working after a day because the local environment of the incision becomes acidic and local anesthetics can't work in an acidic environment, they can't get in the nerve. We added a small amount of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory and meloxicam. It allows the bupivacaine to get into the nerve the entire three to four days, um, allowing it to work and allowing us to show really profound reduction in pain. We've done uh, bunionectomy, which is a well-established pain model for bony surgeries. We've done, bun uh, in addition to bunionectomy, done hernia and abdominoplasty or tummy tuck, which is a very large incision hip to hip, uh, and demonstrated dramatic reductions in pain with patients getting HDX-011 compared to the control group getting unlimited amount of opioids um, or getting bupivacaine solution plus unlimited amount of opioids. Okay, great. 
Um, and, you know, I would, along the lines in terms of drug development and, you know, where we have known safety profiles of some of these older drugs, um, perhaps each of you could sort of explain what you see as the biggest challenges and, and opportunities um, with products developed under the 505B2 um, regulatory pathway of the FDA uh, and you know, how that fits in terms of your, um, um, your, your, your filing strategy and, and clinical development strategy. Sure. Uh, we both enjoy that, that pathway, which is, uh, as Eric mentions, it uh, allows you to file your new drug application without having to prove some basic safety of the drug. Um, you're just changing the route of administration. Uh, but convenience is no longer reimbursed. So uh, I think the days of taking a once-a-day pill and making a twice-a-day pill, those are pretty much done. You need to either show a clinical benefit uh, or a compliance benefit, but you have to show a benefit. Otherwise, uh, because the 505A2s are taking a generic dosage form, uh, that's the competition, is a generic drug. So if you can't differentiate, you're not going to get reimbursement beyond the generic. So uh, it's changed the product screening a lot. Uh, our lead product with Alzheimer's, one of the number one problems with this pill in this patient group is nausea vomiting. Uh, and it's not so much it's an inconvenience, but if any of you have elders uh, that you take care of or monitor closely, they're taking 20, 30 pills at breakfast, including all their heart medication, their blood thinners, and everything else. One of those pills causing nausea is ca cascade effect. So if you can have a medication that reduces that side effect, payers will listen to that. Um, it, taking a once-a-day therapy and turning it into once-a-week therapy or days therapy, that's something reimbursement will listen to keenly. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a, a great review. And um, I've been in pharmaceutical R&D for 30 years, uh, developed over 10 drugs. Uh, most of them unique molecular entities, and they take anywhere from the fastest was a drug for HIV, which was three and a half years, to 10 years to get to market. Um, so the benefit of taking a well-established, well-known prior approved drug uh, and taking that through development in the 505B2 approach, it's dramatically faster and a much lower risk. Rather than a one in 100 chance of success, you now have a very high likelihood of success because you know the drug works and you know its safety profile. Um, and we could take, in the case of the drug we expect approval uh, within the next several weeks, that was invented in uh, 2014. Um, and so the, the time frame from first discovery to registration will be on the order of about three years, um, which you can't do with a new molecular entity. And the risks of um, why, wh whether it's uh, immuno-oncology or any other new drug discovery is extraordinarily high and most fail, uh, which, is, which is why this approach has a lot of merit. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and, and as a follow-up to that, uh, Bubba, I mean, um, given some of the feedback that you've gotten from the FDA, uh, could you talk a little bit about um, your bioequivalence approach um, to, uh, to clinical development of your, your Aricet patch? Um, and uh, along those lines, um, the, some of the safety findings that you found in terms of some of the existing, uh, um, some of the, the, the pilot uh, trials that you've conducted? Yeah, we've, we've done something very unconventional. Um, our active ingredient has a very long elimination half-life. Uh, it's 72 hours, so when you're, it's a daily pill, so when you take the third pill, half of the first pill is still in your circulation and so on. In fact, it takes about five weeks for your blood levels to stabilize and stop rising. Uh, we went to the FDA and said, we have a one-week patch. What if we measured its, efficacy, or sorry, its blood levels in week five along with the pill and just forget how we both got there? It's a chronic therapy. If you're on this medication, you're on it for the rest of your life. And the FDA surprised us and said, that sounds reasonable. And so we went and did a study of two different patch sizes to see if we could get in the ballpark to match this pill, which is hard to do. The pill is doing this every day as you take it, and it's climbing. And our patch kind of chugs along steadily. 
Uh, and then one of our two patches in our first study uh, hit bioequivalence. It's statistically the same as the pill out at steady state. Uh, so the FDA has encouraged this approach. Uh, we will be able to get approval without having tested the drug in a single patient. Everybody will be healthy volunteers, and all we have to demonstrate is that our blood levels at steady state match those of the pill. But along the way, we're going through the skin instead of the stomach, which intuitively seems to indicate there would be lower GI side effects. That was our working theory. Uh, turns out there are six times lower side effects going through the skin than there are the GI. And when we met with the FDA, we, we know that our label's going to have to have something on it in skin irritation because the pill obviously doesn't involve the skin. And we said, but we have a very big difference in GI, which is also due to the different route of administration. Would we be able to put that in the label? And they said, that's not unreasonable. The FDA never says yes until the final yes. So not unreasonable is a win at this stage. So we're proceeding with a, a final bioequivalent study with a slightly larger number of subjects to prove it. We'll file our NDA and, and uh, like Barry said, three years from start to filing. Okay, great. Um, and Barry, you actually have a lot of um, data in many soft and hard tissue indications. Um, you know, I, I was hoping you could um, sort of review some of that data, how that's, uh, you know, it's, uh, the, the, that's differentiated a little bit from some of the, uh, uh, how that's clinically uh, differentiated. Um, and, you know, um, you alluded to this a little bit in some of your opening comments uh, in terms of the opioid crisis here in America and, you know, maybe talk a little bit about how HTX-011 um, could potentially fit in as a, uh, uh, and play an important role in terms of um, helping to address that, that crisis. Sure. Uh, well, I think it's very hard to... Uh to watch the news uh, or listen to the radio and not hear something almost daily about the opioid epidemic in the United States. The, the death rate of overdoses is now essentially the same as it, as it was uh, at the peak of the AIDS epidemic. Um, and so there is a, a substantial amount of political uh, pressure on the FDA to move programs along that might be beneficial uh, there's been a whole number of what are called abuse deterrent opioids, so opioids that are harder to inject, harder to abuse, have gotten priority reviews. Uh, the focus is now turned to the opioid alternatives. So our, our product would fall into the category of opioid alternative, uh, something to be used instead of um, opioids. To but Obviously, the goal is for patients not to have pain. Uh, and so we're working with the FDA to hopefully accelerate the, the development program as well as ultimately the review of the product. We're now in phase three. Uh, again, this, this product was just uh, invented in uh, 2014, uh, 2015 timeframe. So very rapid uh, phase one, phase two development. And during phase two, as Eric mentioned, um, and as I mentioned previously, we've done studies across multiple surgical types. So these are surgeries that patients would normally get an opioid analgesic uh, to control pain for, uh, bunionectomy, a very painful surgery where a metatarsal is cut and a screw is put in, uh, as you can imagine, quite painful. Uh, patients would normally take on the order of you know, 20 or 30 uh, oxycodone containing pills over the, the first three days. We can cut that down to zero uh, in many patients and those that still have a little pain only need one or two uh, to make it through uh, that first three day period. And then once, once you get past that three days, the healing takes place and normally you don't need any opioids. Um, so our goal and now in phase three is to repeat the phase two experience in bunionectomy and in hernia. Uh, and in both of these studies and, and in all of phase two, um, we went against the generic available product, bupivacaine solution. So as previously mentioned, 
payers want you to show a benefit over the cheap generic that happens to be in your new formulation. And we were fortunate enough that in all three phase two studies, head-to-head uh, -head against bupivacaine, we soundly beat bupivacaine solution in terms of pain benefit and the duration of the benefit. As I mentioned, bupivacaine solution works for six hours. Um, and so if you have a product that works for 72 hours or even 96 uh, in many cases, uh, then it's not that hard to beat it. Um, and so we show reduction in pain for that entire duration compared to bupivacaine solution or to placebo. Um, and as I mentioned, there is one other extended release product for bupivacaine on the market uh, because it doesn't have the added benefit of uh, meloxicam. Um, it tends to work for 24 to, uh, you know, for 12 to 24 hours. Um, and, and we feel that our product is dramatically superior uh, and will have a much faster uptake commercially. Okay, great. Um, maybe if we can just talk a little bit about some of the market research that you've done, um, and maybe we can start with you, Baba, uh, you know, just in terms of how big is the market opportunity? Um, you mentioned uh, Exelon patch, um, but how, how do you sort of, um, what does your market research sort of indicate in terms of the, the size of the market uh, for an Alzheimer's uh, um, uh, patch and, and Barry, uh, you know, along the lines uh, similar to, uh, to that. Uh, for HTX011, you have three products, but for HTX011, um, what you see as, as uh, you know, based upon your market research, um, what, what do you see, uh, uh, what, what does your research uh, uh, indicate in terms of the size of that market as well? Well, um, you've got to do primary market research. You can't do internet Google research. You can do that early on, but uh, you've got to get out in the field, and that's what we've done. We've done primary research with physicians, with payers. Uh, we've uh, talked to um, folks that cover 100 million lives in the U.S., so pretty good sampling, uh, about 300 and some docs, uh, and, and caregivers. Uh, in Alzheimer's space, it's a little different because there's usually a caregiver involved, a close friend or family member, uh, and, and the only way we would want to talk to them is if they had a meaningful say in economic decisions. So if there's a copay, we only want to talk to the people that would get a say, if not a, an absolute um, decision. Um, we found some things that surprised us. Uh, we weren't looking for this, but uh, of all the patients, caregivers that had patients on uh, the Exelon patch, which is a billion one dollar patch, 94% said they would switch to our patch if it was weekly. It's a different molecule. It's the same disease, but it, we did not expect that. They said they would gladly switch. That's about 8% of the market right there. Um, each 1% of the market's about a $100 million opportunity on, at today's prices. So um, we, we've got great encouragement across the board. Over three quarters of everybody we survey said they would either definitely or probably uh, you, you prescribe it, reimburse it. Uh, we're not going to be reimbursed as a generic. Uh, the thing I didn't quite appreciate is the health plans um, are not quite the evil uh, bureaucrats we think. They have uh, medical panels. They really do assess medical benefit. I mean, they have a budget. But uh, they are welcome. Uh, they don't want to hear about compliant, uh, sorry, convenience, but they will listen to compliant and uh, side effects. And they will value those appropriately. Well, you're saying nice things about payers and FDA. <laughs> uh, that's there may be some here, you know. <laughs> uh, on, in the pain area, obviously, uh, there's a massive number of surgical procedures in the United States, over 100 million. We discount most of those as not really sufficiently painful to warrant a product like ours. So we hone in on the 30 million procedures a year where patients regularly get opioids at discharge or in the hospital. That's really the, the low hanging fruit from our point of view. And as I mentioned, in that 30 million, 11 million are already getting short acting bupivacaine um, about another seven million are getting other local anesthetics of one kind or another. Um, in our market re extensive market research, um, we found that there is great appetite for a product that actually does work um, over the course of three to four days. 
that, uh, the, and the ability to reduce the need for opioids is very high on the list of P&T committees and hospital formularies uh, because of the societal issues, because of long-term chronic use uh, problems. Uh, but not just that. Uh, the side effects of opioids in the hospital are expensive. Uh, patients frequently have to stay a, an extra day because they're having complications from pain control. Um, so if you can avoid that and get that patient out a day earlier, uh, more than compensates for using a product that would be in the few hundred dollar price range. Um, so we see a very large market opportunity. Uh, we know that we can price our product very competitively so it gets into formularies quickly uh, with substantial uptake. Okay, great. Uh, by the way, I believe there was a question in the front. Uh, yeah. By what mechanism do opioids work? For example, do they interrupt the signal from uh, a nerve to the brain, or do they work by some other mechanism? And is fentanyl a opioid? Yeah, so the, an excellent question on where opioids work. And actually, uh, we, have a, we have a slide in our, uh, our slide deck specifically about that, because we like to focus on stopping pain at the source versus stopping pain at the brain. And so our product, if you think of a hernia procedure, stops pain signal at that procedure. It never gets to the spinal column, never gets to the brain. If you're using opioids for control of pain, the signal goes up to the brain where the opioid receptors basically tell the brain, eh, it doesn't hurt that much. But what we, what we found, and I have to say I was quite surprised, is that even with really unlimited amounts of opioids, patients still experience a lot of pain. Um, and anybody who's had a painful surgical procedure will probably remember that, yeah, you felt less pain, it wasn't as severe, but it still hurt. Um, and in fact, in patients with bunionectomy, even with morphine and oxycodone, they uh, present with pain scores in about five to six range. So it's a zero out of 10 scale, 10 being the worst pain you've ever experienced. Uh, even after a really surprising amount of opioids, they still have pain in the five range. Uh, and where patients who um, get our product are in the three, uh, three to four range. So mild pain, if any. Um, and so what we found is, you know, again, very surprising to me that opioids don't work nearly as well as I think people believed, um, and that you can dramatically reduce the pain compared to opioids by blocking pain at the source versus at the brain. Okay, great. Um, and in the limited amount of time that we do have left, uh, I thought I would give uh, both of you an opportunity to uh, sort of explain to everybody uh, you meet with a lot of investors. Um, maybe if you can explain what you find most, uh, most, what do you think is most underappreciated, uh, both about Corium and Heron today by the investors that you meet with, and what uh, you think makes uh, each of your companies a great name to own for 2018 and beyond. That's a lot. Um, In the limited time that we have left. Two minutes. <laughs> uh, well, um, we've gone from $3 a share to between 10 and 11 this year. Uh, that, a lot of that was a success. Uh, you got to deliver results. Uh, the leashes are very short now. Uh, as somebody once put it, uh, the days of it, uh, using equity as insurance are over. So uh, you raise just what you need to reach the next milestone. And if you don't deliver in full, you're going to get hammered. So uh, luckily, we've delivered in full and then some this year and been rewarded. We also have some very high class names, including Orchard View, in our <laughs> stock. Uh, Perceptive uh, Advisors, um, Broadfin, and Essex Woodlands together, those three own 56% of our stock. So having really respectable investors in your stock helps. Um, but I think you just have to keep delivering it. And our, our short cycle time, instead of taking seven years to develop something uh, where it takes two years to finish your phase one and so on, short cycle time really helps. Uh, and this is a permanent change, I feel, in the equity um, markets. We're no longer going to do $100 million follow-ons and see how it goes. 
Yeah, I think I would also add that uh, the, the, the two companies have another similarity in that we actually have a commercial product or commercial products, which is highly unusual in the small biotechnology space. Um, normally, you uh, are in phase one or phase two, and you're trying to eke out some development milestones, but you have no real revenue to show. Um, so having a revenue stream obviously means that we have to dilute our shareholders less um, and have demonstrated at least some modicum of ability to get drugs approved. Uh, and to how to deal with the FDA and how to deal with payers. Um, so all of that, I think, puts us both in somewhat of a unique category. Uh, and, you know, from my perspective uh, with Heron, uh, the bi biggest obstacle that I run into is that the other product on the market uh, for post-operative pain is only selling around $300 million a year. So therefore, people immediately believe that's the market size. Uh, but if we remember back, and there's so many examples, you know, I, I, I can't give them all, but I look at this like lipid lowering. So cholesterol lowering market, when I got into the business, was niacin. Um, and so if, uh, if large pharma looked at what the total market for lipid lowering was, they would have said not really interested, or even phenofibrate first kind of non-niacin product, um, nobody would have imagined $15 billion Lipitor. Um, and so you have to look at what's the true market opportunity and for the ideal product. And the first product is never the ideal product in our business. It doesn't matter how smart you are, the first product, the second product, never are the big winners. It's usually the third or fourth product to market that takes the learnings of the first ones and then owns the market. Um, and so that's our, that's our strategy, is to own the, own the market. Okay, great. I want to thank uh, both of you uh, for, uh, for participating in this panel, and thank everyone for their time and attention. Thank you. Thanks, Eric.